Yo, Elliot, I'm 32 years old. Some weeks ago, I experienced a situation where I felt pressured by a friend to complete a task that would enhance his career pro progression. So your friend wanted you to do, to do something that was gonna enhance his career. The reason why I felt pressure was because I also needed to complete a task that would enhance my career progression around the same time. I'm not sure if I overplayed the pressure from him in my mind, but ultimately I completed his task before taking care of mine. And this didn't sit well with me because it made me feel that I prioritized someone else over me and felt pressure in doing so. This gave me a bad feeling and I have ruminated on it a lot since then. The rumination has contributed to me having a low mood, low self-worth, isolating myself from people, very rigid thinking and old demons have popped up. I've experienced a sense of depersonalization, which I find very unsettling. I'm trying to come out of this and have signed up for CBT sessions. I don't know what that is. While trying to come out of this, I am feeling that I can benefit from accepting situations, accepting the issues happening as a part of my life, expect for these things to happen. I can be more assertive in my thinking. I recently sat down and tried to identify my feelings about it, so on and so forth. Um, your question, do you have any advice on moving forward for both coming out of this state mood and to prevent myself from going back into this mood in the future? How can I deal with old demons that pop up when I try and move forward? So it's a long question and there's a lot of, I don't wanna say superfluous, but extra details there that I had to just skim over because the, the, the essence of the issue here is not what happened. And I think you know this, it's not about your friend asking you for help. And it's not even about you setting aside your business in order to help him. This has everything to do with your attachment to the emotional experience, dragging it out and living in what Robert uh, Johnson calls a mood. And it made me think of this book by Robert Johnson called He, Understanding Masculine Psychology. And he has an entire chapter on, on it's called On Chastity, but it's really about emotions. It's really about mood. So I'm gonna read to you a little bit here so that maybe you can sort of uh, glean where you are in the story. Now, if you know anything about this book, it's written from the perspective of the story of Parsifal and the Holy Grail, right? And so it's about a young man, right? That's why it's a book about men. It's about a young man who leaves his mom to go become a warrior uh, with the big boys. And as he's out there learning the ropes, learning the world, or as he's preparing to become a warrior, to become a, a real man, uh, he meets a mentor called Gorgumand. Gorgumand is like his Yo Elliot in a way, right? He comes to him for advice and he, uh, you know, he, he gives him things to think about and ways to be as he's journeying on his life. And so he says here in the book, I'm just gonna read straight from the book, Gorgumand's instruction, he gives this instruction to Parsifal, he says, never seduce a fair maiden or be seduced by her. He says, it's such a profound importance in our story that it's worthy a chapter of its own right. So this entire chapter is on that piece of advice. Never seduce a fair maiden or be seduced by her. What does that mean? It's important to remember that we're studying a myth such as this uh, as we would a dream and many of the same laws apply. A dream is almost entirely an inner matter, and every part of a dream is to be construed as a part of the dreamer, right? So this is about, about you. Remember, if a man dreams of a fair damsel, damsel, it is almost certain that his own feminine inner capacity is being addressed. So what Gorgamon is talking about is the maiden within, the female within, right? The, the effeminate aspect of the man, the female aspect of a man overtaking his rationale. He says it's, it's only too easy to literalize such a dream figure and explain it as one's sexual interest or a comment on one's current girlfriend. If one makes this error, the true depth of the dream has been lost. So also in myth, if we take Gorgamon's instruction in a literal sense, we'll have little but a caricature of medieval chivalry before us. What is this inner femininity which Parsifal is to stay aloof from? It is all the softness of femininity 
that is so valuable to an in an inner sense, but that would uh, vitiate him if he mistook it and lived it in an outer sense. So in other words, what he's saying is that the inner damsel, the inner maiden, the inner, the inner woman, the inner feminine needs to be addressed. And I mean, needs to be dealt with as an inner phenomenon because it is then addressed outwardly or it's expressed outwardly, then it's going to lead to, it says it will vitiate him. I'm not even sure what that word means, but it doesn't sound very good. If he starts to live out his inner feminine, it's going to be a problem for him. So we deal with the issue on the inside. Mood and feeling. Feeling is the ability to value, right? So you feel something you feel something, it's the ability to value. I guess you have to value something either in a good or a bad way to feel something about it, right? If I, if I value my uh, dog and he gets hit by a car, I'm, it's gonna hurt me, my feelings, right? Or if I love my wife and, you know, or my child and I'm proud of her because she's doing a great thing, I have a feeling. So it's about what you value. He says though, mood is being overtaken or possessed by the inner feminine. To feel is the sublime act of having a value structure and a sense of meaning where one belongs, where one's allegiance is, where one's roots are. So what you value to mood. We are already in a difficult difficulty since there's no adequate term for being caught up in a mood. He goes on to say to mood is to be in the grips of the feminine part of our nature, to be overwhelmed by irrational elements that play havoc with a man's outer life. The feminine side of a man is to connect him with the depths of his inner being and to make a bridge to his deeper self. Often a man has to make the choice between feeling and mood. If he's engaging in one of these, there's no room for the other. A mood prohibits true feeling, even though a mood may disappear to a feeling, so on and so forth. I don't know if that was helpful, but let me, let me see if I can extrapolate and explain. You had an experience and it was associated with something that you value, right? You value your time, you value your, your career. As a result of some, a decision that you made in order to help someone, which caused you to remove your attention from what you value and give it to someone else, right? And I think you did, I think that was okay that you did that. It was, it was a choice and you need to, might need to explore why you chose to do that, but it's in the doing it, in the doing it, there's nothing wrong. You did it. That's it, it's neutral, right? I value this, but I'm going to remove myself from what I value. And then I'm going to help you. And then I'll come back to what I value. But the problem is that you got, you had a feeling about it afterwards. That's where the problem begins. You had a feeling about it. So you started to ruminate. Those are your words. You started to ruminate, huh? I have my own work to do. Why did I agree to do his work? Now I got to do his work and my work is going to suffer. So then you were angry, right? It was anger that came about. Nothing wrong with feeling, as he says in this book. It's because you value something. And so something that you valued was, it, it, by your own choice, something that you valued was uh, overlooked in order to in order to serve someone else that apparently in some way shape or form you valued helping him you might regret but at that moment you valued his friendship and so you removed the value you removed your sense of uh you removed your energy from the thing that is associated with your career that you value but then you put it towards something else you value so even that it's all neutral it's all neutral right there's no problem there at all but then you caught wind that maybe this isn't right. Somewhere in your mind, somehow, either externally or internally, this arose, right? Someone, something, a demon, or your own fallen nature came up and had resentment. It was like, wow, wait a second. Why did I do this? I shouldn't do this. I value my stuff more than I value his, right? That's your first mistake. First. This is something from Osho. He says, when you have the first instinct to do something, that's the right thing to do and then do it. He gives this example. He says that if you go to a church and they are passing around the plate or they're, you know, they're, they're requesting donations, right? You're gonna give, you're gonna give it to church, he says. He says, if your first instinct is to say, I'm gonna give $100, well, then you give $100. 
That's your first instinct. Give that hundred dollars because it came from your purest sentiment. You didn't think it over too much, meaning it, 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 it was it was spontaneous. It was revealed, perhaps. Right. God revealed to you. Oh, give a hundred dollars. I remember this happening with when I was tithing and I still tithe. I decided that I was going to give fifteen hundred dollars a month to a particular organization that helps homeless people. And that was my first instinct was just just give it to them. Right. As is, as, as was with you. And it's with somebody who's, who's being solicited. But then you go, wait a second. No, 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 I'm not going to give $100. I'll give 50. Yeah, that's more, that's more reasonable. I'll just give 50. Then you think it over a little bit more. The plate's coming around. It's taking a long time. And you're ruminating. You're like, well, you know what? $50 is a lot. You know what? I'm going to give 20. I'm going to give 20. So essentially, you jumped in with two feet because you had pure intentions and it may have been the right thing for you to do, but then you started hesitating. I remember I did that with the $1,500 because that, that was a big chunk for me to be able to give to a charity, essentially, I'm just giving it away. And I remember doing that too, like 15, I did it. And then it started you know, being a monthly thing. And then I'm like, I don't know, man, that's a lot of money. Should I keep doing it? Then I remembered this advice, hey, don't go back. Don't go back. When you, especially when it comes to giving somebody something, charity, and, and your first instinct about it is usually right, right? It's usually right. I want to do good. Some, you you want to do good things for people. It's your friend. You want to do good for, for people who are homeless. You want to give to your church. It's okay. That's not a bad thing. It's not like you're, you know, you, you're, you're feeding into some vice. It's charity. You're basically being charitable. You're being loving. But then you get stingy with your love by thinking about it too much rather than just going through with it. So that was your first problem is that you second guessed yourself. You were okay. You could handle it. You wouldn't have, you wouldn't have, had, you wouldn't have decided to do it if you couldn't do it, right? Unless there was something else in it and it was a disordered uh, emotion like guilt or fear that caused you to do it. But I'm going to assume that wasn't the case. I'm going to assume that it was the charity of your heart. You wanted to give to him. That was your first mistake was then going back. Your second mistake was to allow yourself to be trapped in a mood, like he says here, to feel is fine. To mood is to be attached. And so you get, a man gets into a mood when he feels something and will not stop feeling it. He even says in this book, it's a great book. I really didn't do it justice with the little piece that I read right there. There's a lot of context that's missing. He even says that women handle this better than men. And that's why men shouldn't even let it out. Don't even let your inner, inner feminine make its way out because you're not going to know how to deal with it. Women, because they live on their feminine on the outside, they know how to deal with moods better. And I know this from my own experience and my wife. When I was a beta male, I would get into moods. My wife don't get in moods. She has emotions, but then she lets it go. And he says this in the book. He says, women know how to handle emotions better because there's, from the time they're children, they're so used to being overwhelmed by it that they learn how to manage it. They learn how to, how to, how to manage it by not getting trapped in a mood. So a little girl, and I even remember my wife telling me when she was little, she used to get like, uh, she would have like panic attacks or something when she was, you know, maybe like her, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old. She, was a pan she would get panic attacks. She would be very attached to things because she lived in kind of a chaotic home. And so as a, as a little girl, she started to become familiar with, okay, these are emotions that are coming. I don't like these emotions. I recognize them, but I'm not going to hold on to them. I'm going to let them go. And she, she practiced that. I know she practiced that as a child, because even as we started to date and we, you know, we, we were all through high school and college, there were times where we would get into little scuffles and she would be quick, quicker than me to forgive and forget. Because, and she even, she's very logical. She even explained to me, she's like, well, I've learned how not to hold on to things. Me, here I am being, uh, being a beta male in a mood. Well, I can't, I'm pouting and I can't, I can't seem to shake it because I, because I, identified with the emotion. I let it out. This is another reason why even in that passage that I wrote, he says, Gargamon basically is telling him, be careful about letting out your emotions. Be careful with identifying with your emotions. Keep that on the inside. Keep your, your effeminacy down on the inside. Okay, I had this feeling, but am I going to take it on? Am I going to believe it? Am I going to identify with it? Am I going to carry it around? Or am I going to let it be like a cloud over my head? No. 
That is very effeminate. And essentially what he's saying in the book is that you're being a bitch, right? Or you're being a girl. You're, being, you're acting like a little girl, right? And he, and he goes on. He says, even a little girl knows better than to do that. And it goes both ways, too. He also goes on to explain how you do this. And, and Alexander does, Lowen does a great job of explaining this also in his book, uh, Depression and the Body. He goes on to say that it goes both ways. Men who become passionate about things are caught in the mood, too. Have you, and he gives an, an example in the book. He says, uh, and I ask you if you ever had this example or if you've had this kind of experience where there's something that's going to be, you're going to be going to a party or you're going to be meeting up with some friends or something is looming, exciting that's on its way. And you, and for a week ahead of time, you're like giddy about it. You're excited about it. You can't wait. And people are asking you, you know, are you excited about it? It's coming. And you're like, yeah, I'm so excited. Oh, I can't wait. He says, mm -mm -mm, be careful. Be careful because elation leads to depression in the same way that you're attached to a dip. Well, anger isn't a depressive spirit. Anger is an aggressive spirit. But to the degree that you allow yourself to go aggressive or or extroverted or excited or get too inflated or get too big, get too passionate to the degree is the degree that your collapse is going to be experienced and you're going to be in a depressive mood. You're going to be beat down, sad. I've had this, I've had this bipolar experience before in my life where I'm so excited about something. I think I even remember it like vaguely with Christmas time. And when you have kids, you'll start to notice it also. Leading up to Christmas is exciting. Oh, wow. Can't wait. What's it going to be like? Santa's going to come. And then the day of Christmas, you got about 15 minutes of opening up gifts. And then you're like, huh, hmm. All right. Well. That was anticlimactic. That wasn't what it was all cracked to be. What, what I made it out to be in my mind. And it's what you're doing too. You're making something to be in your mind something more than it is. It isn't. It isn't what you think it is, but you've attached to this imaginary, this, this imagination about it. And now you're carrying a mood around based on an imagination, just like the kid that walks around carrying around the passion and the excitement associated with the imagination of Christmas coming. Christmas is not even here. Christmas might not even come, but you're walking around in the mood associated with it and it feels good. That's effeminate too. So you got to be cautious about it in both ways. You, my friend here, you, you, you made two mistakes. Number one, like I said, you went back on your word and you felt guilty and remorseful and angry about it. Okay, you could stop that, right? You did the right thing, it's okay. You are not gonna fall backwards. You only think that this will take away from you. You only think that by giving something to somebody else is gonna take away from you if you come from an, a lack mentality. That's not an abundant mindset. You wanna have an abundant mindset, right? So that's where you went wrong first. You got fearful that there wasn't enough. Then, you allowed yourself to get this mood to hang over you. You says it contributed to a low mood, low self-worth, isolating myself from people. You became depressed. You did it. It's your fault. And so your question, he says, uh, do you have any advice moving forward for both coming out of this state and prevent myself from going back into the state in the future? Uh, and also, how do I deal with old demons that pop up when, when I try to move on, to move on, move forward. D to deal with this state, first of all, is to recognize that you made it up as a bad issue. There's nothing wrong with what you did. You'll be fine. You do your friend's task. You completed your friend's task, but were you not able to do your task? Is your ta has the deadline for your task passed? Is there no way now? Is the resources of time and energy and, and, and everything that it takes to complete these tasks gone? Is it done? Is it done for you? Do, is, are you proceeding from that type of a lack mentality in your life? Or it's really not that big a deal. You were charitable towards your friend. It's a good thing. Don't take too much pride in it, because that's another problem, right? Look at me, I help people. Look at me, I help people. That's mood too. Because then when somebody rejects your help, oh man, right? But it was charitable. It was righteous. It was selfless and that's okay to give your friend. You don't lose anything as a result. It doesn't seem like you've lost anything. I haven't heard that you've lost anything as a result. So the first thing is 
You have thinking errors. So you asked me how to come out of this state, recognize that you were deluded, you were wrong. You're making wrong judgments, wrong thinking, right? That's, you're not living in reality. You are prompted to do something good, stick with it. Stick with it fully, full-heartedly. Now, because you've retracted your good intentions towards your friend, even if you complete his task, every action is measured by the sentiment from which it proceeds, so you've dirtied your task. You've, you, and I don't, hey, hang out. I don't want you to get a mood about that either, right? Don't, get, don't take what I'm saying and feel guilty about it. You just need to see it what it is, why? So you don't do it again. Coming out of this state means recognizing that it's a false state, it's a fake state, you made it up. And, and, and you know the beauty about things that you make up? You can unmake it. You realize it's fake. Okay, that really didn't make any sense. Stop, right? That's, that's operating from reason. That's being logical. That's being masculine. Okay, I see my mistake. I won't do it anymore. Oh, why did I do that? Something wrong with me. That mood, moody. You're, you're, you're seducing the fair maiden. You're being a bitch, right? Being a little girl. Stop it. That's the first thing. Second thing, when a feeling comes, allow it to pass through, be objective, but don't believe it. Don't hold on to it. Don't make a God of it. Don't worship it. Let it go. Let it go. You, the feeling comes from a value. Okay, you, maybe you had your value. You, maybe you were sure about your values in that moment. So you made a decision. You made an unconscious decision because you weren't were, uh, aware of the values. You weren't. You didn't have a value structure. Now you can have a value structure, right? That's what it did. It taught you something about value structure. But once you're aware of that and the feeling can prompt it, you got to let it go. You let it go completely. And I'm happy that I don't have magic advice for you. I think it's good that you're suffering right now. I think you need to go through this suffering right now as a means of transformation. This is going to prompt you to stop doing it. Stop being that way. Again, don't take the things I'm saying as shaming. Don't feel guilty because that thing is just a circle jerk. I'm a man talking to a man and I'm telling my man, behave like a man. Stop getting attached to the feelings. Stop getting into moves. Stop taking yourself too seriously and you'll be all right. You'll be all right. I don't know if you need cognitive behavioral therapy. I don't think that that's necessary, right? That's what CBT apparently stands for. Somebody said it to me. I don't think that there's something wrong with you. I think you're just a, a man acting like a woman. You're a man, as Robert, as Gorgamond uh, asserts in the book, who's seducing and being seduced by the fair maiden, your inner bitch, right? So stop it. And that's really my advice. My advice is stop it. He says, how do I deal with old demons that pop up when I try to move forward? Well, recognize them. You got to see it. You got to objectify it. And then you got to destroy it in your life. Not through emotional battle, but through a stoic battle of discernment. Get out. You don't belong here any longer. And move on. And just move on. It happens to me, dude. It happens to me. It definitely happens to me. It's happened to me before my past. And I see it happening with me at certain times in my life today. And I recognize it for what it is. And I cut it off and I leave it alone. Right? Get busy with something else. That's another thing. Another thing is the only reason why a man will ruminate like this is because he's not busy on his purpose. You got too much time on your hands, bro. Thinking too much. Right? And I've been there. Think too much. Thinking too much. Go do something. Go take a walk. Go do some push-ups. Right? Go paint your house. Go do something so you're not sitting there ruminating and thinking and plotting and scheming and having feelings and getting stuck in, in a mood. All right, bro? So, hope that helps. Keep me posted. Done. Yo, it's your bro, Elliot. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, you ought to know that it was a clip from one of my most recent King Transformation classes with my students where, among other things, we get together about four or five hours a week and we speak on things as it relates to becoming kings in our lives and fitness, 
business, and with women. That sounds like you when you want to join a like-minded group of men who are growing stronger every day, in every way in this degenerate age, then it's real simple. Just follow me on Instagram, and then DM me the word King, K-I-N-G, and then me and my team will get back to the details to see if you qualify. I really hope to see you at the next meeting. Done.